Jason Murchie is a philosophical thinker and independent scholar, as well as founder of Values of the Wise. Jason's fourth book is entitled Wisdom, a very valuable virtue that cannot be bought. It's a unique combination of psychological research findings, philosophical principles and personal insights. He says, the ideas I stand for are not mine. I borrowed them from Socrates. I swiped them from Chesterfield. I stole them from Jesus and I put them in a book. If you don't like their rules, whose would you use? So I'd like to fire off with that question on how you would define wisdom. What are some of the hallmarks of wise thinking and behavior? In your book, you say, Obviously, it cannot be approached in, in a simplistic way, but how can we uh, narrow this down a bit? Right. Uh, just to clarify, although I would love to uh, take credit for the quote you just shared, that was actually Dale Carnegie. Um, okay. But uh, that's kind of my thing is to um, try to, I feel like if I can lead a, a symphony of, of voices, then that strengthens my message or argument, however you want to phrase it. So I, I quote over 1,500 people in the book, um, not in an annoying way, I don't think, but uh, just, you know, um, basically uh, when it's right, I'll, I'll feather in things that they've said that are interesting or um, maybe a little bit contrasting or uh, can bolster my point of view. So that's an example of, you know, just a wonderful quote said probably, you know, in, I don't know, 19... 40 or something. And uh, it just, it stands strong even today. Um, so as to how I treat wisdom, um, it's, it is a complicated question to say, you know, what is wisdom? Um, so I like the way you, you kind of um, <clears throat> frame that more along the lines of, you know, what, uh, what characteristics or hallmarks of wisdom do you find to be useful in trying to understand the phenomenon uh, and it, you know, it's just it's important to say up front. It's a it's a, a bit of a um, challenging phenomenon to grasp, um, even to see in your everyday life. It's uh, it reminds me of of uh, you know maybe like mindfulness, something that if you forget about it, it's it's completely you know it's a thousand miles away. If you've forgotten about being mindful, but when you go there mentally, there it is right in front of you. So wisdom is like that too. <clears throat> you can go through your whole day without thinking once about wisdom or trying to be wise or caring about anything but the minutia and, and the mundane. But if you just spend half a second and think, okay, what is wisdom and how does it help me in this situation? It will come to you, uh, I think. So I think some of the characteristics that are useful to think about, um, you know, when you, when you look it up in the dictionary, you get the whole um, sort of being smart or having a wide ranging vision or being able to see the um, parts and the whole at the same time. So you can choose, would, would I rather see these as, as separate or together? Those, those are some, you know, kind of standard ideas about wisdom. And also I think there are other useful ones. And I sort of took a tip from Stephen S. Hall, the, um, the journalist who wrote the book in 2010 called Wisdom from Philosophy to Neuroscience. Um, and, and he was on the right track, I think. And ever since 2004, I've been looking at the values and the virtues of wise persons. And so it kind of just made a little braid where I was like, okay, Stephen Hall and I agree that wisdom is complex and, and elusive when you stare straight at it. But if you'll kind of stare off in the distance, it'll sort of appear in your peripheral vision. So um, things like compassion and empathy, I do believe uh, are values that a, a wise person would have. <clears throat> um, that is, they approach the world, not thinking just about themselves, but they try to connect with other things, people, um, you know, the planet being probably the largest um, thing that they try. Actually, I guess you could say the infinite would be the largest thing that a wise person would try to connect with mentally. And I think planet um, and then, you know, nation, not nation, but nations in the planet, you know, the idea that humans are all really of the same race, same species, if you will, you know, they, they shouldn't be divided so much by geography or nationalistic concerns or religions and such. Um, or holistic and, and, thinking. 
Yes, yes, yes. Um, yeah. And so, you know, I'm happy to, to say more about other, um, the, you know, um, you know, signposts of wisdom, but I think that the empathy, um, compassion, altruism uh, angle is one that is fruitful and, and interesting. Uh, well, the technology has obviously enabled us access to a huge amount of information, but that, of course, cannot be compared to wisdom. We seem to be drowning in information and starving in wisdom. Just if we look at the politics around us, it's telling us there is such a huge lack of wisdom. Yes. I... Uh... Would you like me to opine on that? Yes, okay. please. Um, absolutely, absolutely true. Um, you know, when you look at, uh, I think in the New York Times, as of today, the day this was taped, um, they did an interesting piece about um, finding 16 people uh, who have opinions. I think, I think the thing they had in common was they believed that the system is absolutely broken. Uh, I think if you, if you, if you were willing to endorse that, wholeheartedly, then you can maybe become part of this focus group. And obviously, they try to balance it politically. Um, and in so doing, you know, it had a, a natural balance of, of, you know, ethnicities, um, and also, you know, gender, um, political viewpoints, as I mentioned, um, age. And so when these people get together to essentially share their viewpoints in a, in a large circle, you can see some, some quick and obvious ways in which Americans nowadays see so clearly the differences between them. Um, it's, it's actually kind of a striking phenomenon. Um, now, humans do this naturally, but Americans seem to be really far down that uh, rabbit hole in regard to within one sentence, you can sort of pick up what you kind of think about that person. Um, that's a type of intuition or what uh, Daniel Kahneman might call fast thinking. Um, and, you know, the scholar Jonathan Haidt, I think is how you pronounce his name, H-A-I-D-T. He and Greg Lukianoff, they, they look at politics um, in the sense of, you know, how, what, are the, what is this thing, liberalism and conservatism? And how do these two party, these two um, philosophies, um, ideologies, how do they tend to think? how they tend to think of the other. And it's a big issue in America now, you know, the other. And um, that's just, that's one step down that path that we really have to be very um, hesitant about accepting because in South Africa, for example, you know, they, they were very quick to say, well, there's us and then there's them. And for, for decades, maybe a century, I'm afraid I don't know too much about the history of South Africa, but it was pretty clear that the first thing you notice about a person is race, race in quotes, as in African or, you know, descendants of the Dutch. Um, and uh, that was the big dividing line. And then apartheid, of course, you know, cleaved a huge uh, swath right to the middle of society. And you were either on this side of it or that side of it. And, um, you know, Spoiler alert, it, it didn't work out that well. <laughs> so, yes, well, I grew up in apartheid South Africa. I know all about that. And mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it very much, uh, it, once you have an ideology in place like apartheid, <clears throat> is, 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 of course, very divisive and, and puts people into tribal mode, in quotes. Yep. And yep. Uh, I'm afraid we're seeing not only in America this phenomena increasing, but globally. This, this fanaticism of, of people falling into a belief and, and not wanting to accept uh, the uh, idea, the proposal uh, of the other. Uh, he's right, immediately right. defined as being the tribe of the, of the other, the enemy, uh, whatever. So it's, what's your theory on what, 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 uh, uh, what is happening in the mind on, on, on a collective level? You mean when this thing when this, when you when you see this phenomena growing? Okay. Um, well, you know, species of animal who are social, they tend to be tribalistic. Um, you know, you can see it in chimpanzees like crazy. 
um, orangutans, um, baboon, baboons are just plain merciless. Um, and so it's just woven into the fabric of, of life forms, at least on this planet. Um, and it has a survival advantage, I think, but it also takes victims, you know, in, a, in an amazing clip. Um, and hierarchy is not something that serves us as well as it probably did in times past. So that's the overwhelming tendency for human beings, I think, is to be that way. Um, however, um, you know, when somebody is able to realize that there's a tendency or a predisposition to something either within or as a community as a whole, uh, you know, like for example, the Catholics and now uh, Baptists, at least in America, they've had to accept that the priests and the pastors have molested children in the past. Uh, let's just say in the past. And uh, the, you know, the Canadians just the other day, you know, according to this taping, um, the Pope was there to apologize. I mean, they, there were huge numbers of dead children due to the, abuse that was going on at the hands of, of Catholic priests. Um, and of course, you know, the Spanish were also Catholic and horrible to the indigenous peoples of the West. So all this is to say that, um, you know, this is just how groups tend to behave, at least when they are unbridled and when uh, hierarchy and authoritarianism runs amok. And so this is something that, that we uh, modern humans have to think really hard about and try to work against um, so as to try to have some sense of, of unity because it is quite possible for a person to view themselves according to a, a structure of concentric circles, right? You can think about the self, like me, just me, which of course is where a lot of people get stuck. And then one level out is like my family says, and my family is more important than you and your family. Um, and then you know, community, tribe, uh, part of a nation. There, you know, there's a huge division between folks who are kind of Southern slash Confederate in their in their culture and others in the United States. And then, you know, the United States versus other countries, you know, they say you cannot come into this country uh, for various reasons. This is us, that's you. And so right now I think we've got, um, you know, kind of the the train has, has, uh, has no brakes and, uh, we're at this place where because certain individuals and and forces have been stoking this these embers for so long it it's almost as though you know to use the frankenstein uh you know metaphor we've created a monster and and now it's it's too difficult to it's it is very difficult to control and you know i think a lot of the responsibility lies at the at the at the feet of somebody like, uh, you know, uh, Rupert Murdoch and Roger Ailes from Fox News, they knew very well what they were doing the whole time. And Rush Limbaugh knew damn well he was a liar. And they just kept doing it over and over again. Why? Because they had, a, they had an audience and because the audience meant advertiser dollars. And, you know, they were spewing out all this propaganda and, and disinformation, lies and whatever. And it's only it's only worse today. I mean, you can compare Rush Limbaugh in 1990 or whatever to Alex Jones today, and you can't say it's gotten any better. And so that's that's deeply frightening. There doesn't even seem to be a consensus on on common values, uh, which which uh, bind a society. And uh, as I said, I mean, you don't only see this phenomena in America, but uh, also in Europe uh, where I live, right. and. Uh, when I look at my own home country, South Africa, South Africa was on the brink of civil war until you had this wise man, Mandela, uh, come up to unite the nation with a common value, which was his rainbow nation, which is his dream of a rainbow nation. And I really like how you mention his, um, his um, delving into stoic wisdom while he was in prison. I didn't know that which is very interesting in your, your, your chapter eight of your book, uh, where you go into applied wisdom. How do you, how do you go into applied wisdom? Yeah, it's, uh, it's reminiscent of um, Boethius, uh, the, uh, the um, medieval 
um, philosopher. He was in prison and died. Um, but before he did, he was, I mean, you could picture him in a, in a dungeon, basically, not unlike Mandela. And um, Boethius was, was maybe like half crazy at that point, maybe we'll say. And he had sort of a vision, but instead of having a vision of the Christian viewpoint of the world, I guess you'd say, um, he thought of as philosophy as being kind of um, personified like a goddess. So he would, he would capitalize it in his book, um, The Consolations of Philosophy. And he felt consoled by philosophy and he just reflected on it and uh, was able to smuggle out a manuscript. And luckily we have it, you know, a, a millennium later. Um, and obviously, uh, you know, Mandela was, was um, trying to tap into, uh, you know, what, what have human beings thought of before that is useful to me in my current plight. And as I said, usually religion serves that purpose, but it's also, there's also a, a rich secular tradition of, you know, everything from Marcus Aurelius's meditations to, you know, maybe Martin Luther King writing a letter from a Birmingham jail, you know, things like this, where they're like, I'm, I'm in very serious trouble under a great amount of stress. What can I do? What can I focus on that is going to help me in this situation? And so Mandela is, he's one of, you know, if, if, uh, if you were to have a pantheon of wise individuals, you know, people who did good while they were on the, this planet for the period of time they were, you know, you've, you've got Gandhi, you got Helen Keller, um, Socrates, some would say Jesus of Nazareth, um, and clearly Nelson Mandela. Yeah. Um, is uh, Stoicism, uh, uh, there is, uh, you say, a resurgence in, in, in the Stoic thinkers, uh, one way of uh, uh, looking at how to uh, break this this, this tribalistic fanaticism. Yes, and 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 also just having your you sort of like keeping your eyes on the prize, if you will. So, you know, what was Mandela thinking when he was um, working toward peace and reconciliation? What does reconcile mean? Reconcile means to come together rather than to stay apart and to try to bridge differences that exist in philosophy um, and ideology and such. And, you know, the way he uh, basically, you know, licked his fingers and, and put out that fuse was to say, you know, we can um, try to take vengeance on the whites, but in so doing, we're going to destroy the entire country because you think the whites are going to act like Jesus and, uh, you know, become prostrate and say, we've wronged you, uh, you know, do what you need to do. No. Yeah. So, and, and if they are better armed, it's a, a huge conflagration. So what Mandela was saying was, I know we feel like this, and I use the word feel very purposefully. However, we ought not to act on those dark feelings because let's think about where that's going to get us. And so that's just, I mean, that's philosophy in action. That's a beautiful thing. Yeah, yeah. And going, going into uh, rational thinking, what are the pros and cons here? Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I met Mandela some months after his release. And when he entered the room, with just a small group of people with him. Uh, I, had, I just had this, this intuitive feeling that this was a very, very wise man in front of me. Uh, it, was, it was something I never experienced elsewhere. Uh, and if I look around the world and I look at the leaders of today, I don't see uh, uh, any Mandela figure who's going to get us out of this quagmire. Yeah, we're, we're particularly bad nowadays at choosing leaders. I mean, the combined um, terms of Boris Johnson and Donald Trump, um, you know, it, what is it like 15 years or 10 at least? And, you know, we, we sort of rue the day when we elect people like this, because uh, when we're in the, in the uh, ballot box, we tend to think this person is going to be my savior. They're going to, they're going to do right. They're going to, 
turn the tide and um, in case in the case of Donald Trump specifically, he, he's going to kick butt and take names. And that's what I want. I want him to destroy the system and rebuild it back up. Like he said, he like he promised he will, like he would. And, uh, you know, that's basically the cult of personality in operation. And, you know, somebody once accused me in, in the book of considering one of the American political parties basically a cult. <laughs> and I can't say that that's a, a grave mischaracterization. Um, because it's a cult, uh, if you were to look at the definition of a cult. I mean, uh, you know, he virtually asks his people to drink Kool-Aid, uh, and they do. Um, and, and you know, the things that they are willing to believe uh, has no evidence behind it. The things have no evidence behind them, and therefore it's just an emotional phenomenon. And that's how fascists get elected. And then fascists do what they want to do when they're elected and they can, they can turn on you, which is why there's that famous, um, you know, poem. I think it was, I think it might be by um, Reinhold Niebuhr. Um, maybe I'm wrong about that, but it's, it's famous. So, you know, many listeners would know it. First, they came for the communists, dot, 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 right? The end line is, then they came for me, but there was nobody to save me because, um, I forget how it ends because they'd all been killed, something like that. So it shows the folly of thinking I can align myself with a person or a party who will do work on my behalf or my tribe's behalf. It's going to work out fine because we've got this enemy that we have to overcome. But as George Orwell showed in 1984, often it doesn't work like that. And people end up being uh, horribly disappointed by uh, choosing such a leader. If we look at uh, uh, not only Trump and, and uh, Boris Johnson, but also at Putin, the common trait here is that they are voices of, of grievance. Uh, they right. all have some, some type of uh, grievance. And um, there's, there's for, for Boris Johnson, it was the European Union. For Trump, it was the Mexicans. And for, for Putin, it's uh, the Ukrainians and everyone else. Um, so. Uh, and, and stirring up this 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 uh, emotion, um, the the, the uh, uh, fanaticism, which then, as we know from history, uh, leads to catastrophe. Um, and uh, where, where where do we see where do we see this 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 whole phenomena ending? Yeah, you were right to to reference history because I think Hitler is sort of the archetypal uh, you know image of. Uh, one who has a grievance. Um, his entire platform was based on was based on grievance, and absolutely with Trump, with Trump, you constantly hear, "They are doing this to me. They've cheated me. They are the enemy. They must be overcome. You must fight like hell." Things like this, and so there's always going to be a an other, and you know it should be contrasted. That that phenomenon can and should be contrasted with something that theologian Martin Buber talked about with the I thou relationship. So I thou, and you know, it's capital T H O U meaning you are a, you, you are an important um, entity. You deserve respect from me. And uh, I ought to listen to you and treat you as I would want to be treated. Um, and so the I thou is obviously completely missing from the mentality and the, and the, speech of individuals who don't care about the other at all. Absolutely. Um, and, I, I find it so interesting that you, you just mentioned Martin Buber in that respect. Uh, very poignant. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it's, um, well, I guess I don't know what to say uh, after that, but uh, so ask me something. <laughs> yes, how do we move forward? Uh, you know, we, we, we just went through some uh, um, analysis of the uh, public narrative at the moment, uh, not only in, in the US, but um, globally, where uh, democracy is, is a very um, fledgling uh, plant to nurture. Uh, so uh, mm. what uh, uh, your, your book, I think, is, is, is very topical. It's, it's, it really fits our time. Uh, and uh, I, I hope uh, we, it, it finds many readers. 
because it has such a lot of wisdom in it. And it's one of these books that you, you can read several times over and you always find a new aspect in it. Uh, it yeah, or as has been my experience, you, you always seem to find a mistake if you read, <laughs> if you read long enough. <laughs> um, which is an interesting point about humility. But, um, you know, as far as what's the prescription, we, we kind of have some understanding of the diagnosis and the prognosis. So what's the prescription for health? Um, and I think it's absolutely suitable to say, you know, um, there are people alive today. There must be, you know, 10,000 thinkers and activists and professors, authors, et cetera, et cetera, uh, you know, podcasters, bloggers who have some part of the truth um, in mind. So um, I don't mean to say that there's nobody alive who is worthy. It's not true. However, um, we ought to remember those who have come before us. Uh, and now that we have the advantage of, of time and distance from them, we can, we can completely analyze if we're willing to take a little effort, make a little effort to see, you know, what, what did they say? What did they embody that's worth remembering? And so, you know, individuals like, uh, you know, Seneca or, um, a Gandhi, um, the Buddha, perhaps these are individuals who, um, you know, yeah, we don't know a hundred percent about them. Maybe some of it is a little bit of legend, but, um, you know, a lot of people are very, very willing to suspend disbelief and, uh, and believe in, in Jesus as, as being, uh, divine. So I would think that one could, you know, be, uh, somewhat willing to take a little leap of faith that, that things that Seneca wrote about are, still important and some of the phenomena that uh plato talked about a long time ago are are not uh you know uh, antiquated and foolish um so you know having said that i would say um just to study wisdom is is an important phenomenon okay so wisdom is kind of like the it's like physical fitness okay so if you want to go uh on a deep walk um like you have you know you you can't just hit the road one day uh, because you kind of feel like it may be bringing lunch with you. You know, you've got to be like, this is going to be a journey. I need to train for it. So my training starts today. Um, and, and likewise, if you have a, a mountain to climb in front of you, that is not of the physical kind, you know, the actual kind, but of the metaphoric kind, you need to train for that. Um, and, and so I would say that just, understanding something about wisdom and trying to come to respect it and uh, keep it sort of front of mind throughout much of your day is, you know, that's an extremely important um, approach. And obviously some of the ways that you can get to know wisdom and come to appreciate it is to read some of the quotations that ostensibly wise persons have, have said, because I think of those as little, little, treasures little time capsules you know you can open it up and see wow this was this was said you know 300 yeah, they're, they're, years ago. they are real real gems in there uh, oh, thank you what what is your your favorite one <laughs> or one of your favorite ones <laughs> it's 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 actually very hard to to pinpoint um you know i think one one way i would kind of dodge that question would be to say you know um what's one thing that's interesting about using many quotations in the same book from disparate individuals is that the person who is willing to put in a little effort can um, be very profitable by, by thinking about, you know, how do these people relate to each other? What are their differences, you know, comparison and, con and contrast, um, you know, think about, uh, so in the same chapter, Jason came up with, you know, a hundred, quotations from, from psychologists, um, you know, existential humanists, uh, um, philosophers, personal growth experts, um, and they've all got something in common. What is it they have in common? Um, mm -hmm. How do I, you know, what can I take from this? What's the, what's the marrow of, of just these? I mean, if you think about words, they're just little, you know, typewritten prints on a piece of paper. It's the human mind that projects onto them meaning 
and um, can um, find something of value uh, in them. So although there are many interesting quotes in there, I think if you, if you are willing to, to chew on them, they will provide, um, you know, their gift, their gift to you. Um, and the same is, is done in that old uh, tradition of looking at great uh, books, you know, classic texts, things that have been written by everybody from Plato on to, um, you know, modern, maybe in the 1950s or 70s would be kind of where the great books sort of uh, come to a stop because you do need a certain number of decades between you and a great book in order to really be confident it's a great book. You know, uh, Don Quixote is great. Nobody can make an argument really that is not great. It's not um, fruitful to read it in some way, shape or form. And so within all of those books from various different traditions and time periods and cultures, we're all, you know, I think many of them were talking about the very same things. And that to me is a clue that the things they were talking about have uh, great value. Um, and the things they were not talking about or talking against can be treated appropriately. So, you know, greed, for example, might be referenced by um, Seneca or Cicero. Um, and, uh, and that's important to think of, you know, what are they saying about greed in a denigrating fashion? You know, why don't they like greed? Okay, they're talking about philosophy now, or character, or uh, wisdom, or virtue, or courage. Why do they like those? Um, so... So that I think is a is a good good closure. I really liked your quote from Henry Amiel, where um, he basically says that uh, wisdom is independence of all social, political, and religious prejudice. Uh, I, I found that was was very uh, topical for our times, right, 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 and very difficult to live. <laughs> yeah, by definition, these things are difficult. Um, you know, the things that the Dalai Lama is prescribing um, are not often fun things or easy, um, but, you know, show me a, a rich philosophical or theological tradition that is easy. You know, uh, certainly you would not point to Christianity. Um, you probably wouldn't point to Buddhism, Stoicism, um, existentialism. They're all difficult. So the question is, do you want to do that work or do you not? And if somebody doesn't want to, if they just love yeah football and uh you know golf and uh you know i don't know goofing off well then that's yeah. their choice yeah. but a lot can be said for um you know trying to learn the things that um the world has to teach Here, here's a favorite quote for you sooner or later life makes a philosopher out of us all by maurice uh, riesling that's a, a very good closure uh, jason and thank you so much for spending your time with us today and uh, um, I will mention the book again, and I hope uh, it finds many readers. I think it's a very important message for our time in there.